There is no battle in American history more documented than the Battle of Gettysburg. There are so many tales of survival, courage, bravery that transpired on these fields on the first three days of July in 1863. Because this is the most famous battle, there have been quite many tales told. Some of them are true, some of them not so much. We're standing at an often overlooked part of the battlefield called Barlow's Knoll, and we're going to explore the story of one of the most famous human interest stories of the American Civil War happened right here. And we're going to decide, was it true or was it made-believe? On the morning of July 1st, 1863, the Union First Corps and elements of the Confederate Army under command of Robert E. Lee are fighting on the west side of Gettysburg. Around noon, there's going to be a lull in the action, and the battle's going to start shifting north of town. Reason being, the 11th Corps of the Union Army has just arrived, and this is a corps commanded by Oliver Howard. Now, the 11th Corps got a bit of a reputation going into this battle. They're looking for redemption, all these soldiers here. See, a few months back, at the Battle of Chancellorsville on May 2nd, 1863, the 11th Corps was put on the Union right flank. Problem was, the flank was not properly anchored, and they became the victim of Thomas Stonewall Jackson's Confederate assault. They were uprooted, immediately pulled back into the Union center, complete chaos ensued, and ultimately the battle of Chancellorsville is considered the most decisive Confederate victory of the war. General Hooker, who was commander of the Army of Potomac at the time, was forced to retreat back across the Rappahannock River, and that will begin Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North in the summer of 1863. The 11th Corps have been the laughing stock of the Army of the Potomac. They've been blamed for that loss at Chancellorsville. So the 11th Corps is made up of predominantly German immigrants. Uh, several of their commanders, however, are well-to-do uh, American-born uh, leaders. So you got a bit of a culture clash happening between the foot soldier and your officers. One of those officers is the commander of this division that took this knoll. It's a guy by the name of Francis Barlow. Barlow was born in New York in 1834 and then moved up to Massachusetts where he was able to get into Harvard and graduate with a law degree. Barlow is not very much liked by his soldiers. Reason being, he is considered too hard on the soldiers. He's very much a person of discipline. He's also an abolitionist. He feels strongly about the abolition movement. Now, there's some evidence that shows that it's not necessarily because he uh, believes in equal rights to individuals with dark skin. It is more so the fact he does not believe in holding people in bondage. Now, what Barlow is going to do is, when he arrives here around noon on July 1st, 1863, he is going to move, his division is gonna be put out into the field behind me. Now behind me in that clearing was actually a complex of buildings known as the Alms House, the poor house of Adams County. He's put just behind those structures. He is supposed to be in line facing north of town, so the left flank of the 11th Corps can be connected with the right flank of the 1st Corps, which again are facing that direction west. Problem is, he sees that there's this high ground above him, and if the Confederates get this high ground, they can shoot right down onto the 11th Corps. So, without getting approval, Barlow's going to move his men from their original position on top of this knoll. Uh, most of the terrain north of Gettysburg is relatively flat, except for this prominent knob. By the time Barlow gets in position on this knoll around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's at the same time that elements of Jubal Early's Confederate division are making their way down the old Harrisburg Pike from the north directly toward the town of Gettysburg. So just as the Union soldiers get into position, they're immediately going to be walking up here into a storm of fire. Now, keep in mind, the view in front of us has changed a little bit. Uh, I don't believe the corn would have been, I don't know if there was a corn planted on the knoll. And, Personally, I don't see why Barlow would move up if this was all covered in corn. So you'd be able to see up to where those tree chops are. And there's a wall of trees in front of me on the other side of this cornfield. Those trees have been more spacious in the 1860s. The reason that tree line's there today is it's the mass the fact that that is the current end of property for the national battlefield. But Barlow's going to move his men up here. But by doing so, he's going to have to stretch his division quite thin. They're more in a skirmish line than actually a true line of regiments. Mm -hmm. 
You'll notice behind me there's a group of four cannon. Uh, they were put on top here at the knoll at the apex of Barlow's line. Uh, these were commanded by a Lieutenant Bayard Wilkinson. Uh, Wilkinson, uh, he's, only, he's only in his early 20s when he's out here, very young in age. Uh, his father works for the New York Tribune as a correspondent. Uh, he's going to make his way up here. And just as he gets his guns in position, within the first few shots, immediately they're going to be starting taking counterfire from a hillside. It's kind of hard. You can't see it today because of the cornfield. Uh, there's a hillside over there where 12 Confederate cannon were placed. And eventually, Confederate forces are going to get artillery on top of Oak hill over that direction firing down this way so you have crossfire from two confederate batteries hitting wilkinson's four guns uh one of those balls one of those cannonballs are going to hit hit the horse that he's riding upon shrapnel from the exploding shell is going to destroy wilkinson's right leg and he is going to fall over pinned by the horse he's going to be forced to take out a pocket knife and amputate his leg and he will be dragged to the almshouse where hopefully he'll seek medical attention. So right here at the apex of the Barlow's line would have been the 153rd Pennsylvania. Now the 153rd were only a nine months regiment. They recruited uh, in September of 1862, just shortly after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, the regiment up to this point has only been in one major battle, and that was Chancellorsville, where they were on the very right flank of the Union line. So, hey, yeah, no, what a wonderful introduction to the military life. Oh, uh, the 153rd were one of those regiments I mentioned that most of the Army of, Nor uh, Army of the Potomac were blaming for the loss at Chancellorsville. They have something to prove. Now, their enlistment goes up in June of 1863, so technically they're on waivers while they're out here at the Battle of Gettysburg. The reason they stayed with the Army, even though they're not much fans of Barlow as a divisional commander, their home state is being invaded by, by the Confederate Army. They want to defend it. Now, the 153rd Pennsylvania are unique as almost all the soldiers involved were recruited right out of Northampton County, Pennsylvania. You don't normally see that all the, all the people in one regiment come from one county. Now, two of their companies are actually being sent ahead to be a forward skirmish line. The rest of them are going to be kind of pulled around the military crest of this knoll. It's also important to note that on top of their monument, you'll notice the bugler is actually kind of facing more toward the north, uh, uh, more toward the northwest rather than directly north, because that's where they're expecting the attacks to come from. The battle started again coming from the west. They're not expecting Jackson's old corps, now commanded by Richard Newell, to come right on, the, uh, right in front of them, right for these trees. And boy, could you imagine their shock when the soldiers, who, uh, these Confederate soldiers, the same ones who had attacked them in Chancellorsville, are now attacking them again. The 153rd Pennsylvania, in fact, all of Barlow's force have found themselves in a similar situation in Chancellorsville. On the right flank, exposed, and immediately being hit with a hot fire. The regiment went into battle with about 570 men. They'll suffer a 37% casualty rate. So it looks like I got a humble collector here. Uh, he is the oh. map person today for our tour of Barla's Knoll. So to give you an idea, we have the, uh, you can't see my finger, now you can see it in the camera. No, no you can't. There's so much action happening here, it's crazy. And like, keep in mind, this oh, has yeah. all happened within like an hour or so. But the 153rd are on this side of the hill, so roughly on the other side, they were in that corn is today. Just behind them is the 17th Connecticut. And the 17th Connecticut will rush up here to try to extend the right flank a little bit farther of the Union line. A little bit about the 17th Connecticut. They were organized in late August of 1862. Uh, initially, they were defending the railroads around Baltimore before being moved up to Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, they had already lost their first lieutenant colonel at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And being led into Gettysburg is by their second lieutenant colonel, Douglas Fowler. Uh, Fowler is a locksmith from Guilford, Connecticut. And he's going to ride up here on a beautiful white horse. And... I gotta be honest, by reading about Barlow's Knoll, everybody who gets into an issue up here is always described wearing a, riding a beautiful white horse. Did everybody have a white horse back then? I think there might be some embellishment. But anyways, 
Fowler's gonna ride up here. He's gonna start rallying his men. As he gets up here, he's calling for them, calling for him to come up here. And as he turns away, a piece of grape shot will hit him in the head. His head explodes onto his adjutant standing next to him. You can imagine the shock of the 17th Connecticut seeing their commander's head be, well, for lack of better terms, blown to smithereens in front of them just a few moments into the fight. And very quickly, uh, the 17th Connecticut is going to start faltering. Uh, Albert Peck, who was a second lieutenant of the 17th Connecticut, he'll ride up here and he'll later call Barlow's Knoll the standard of hell. In 1884, the 17th Connecticut Monument was dedicated. Following year, veterans came back to dedicate a flagpole. This is in particularly in honor of their Lieutenant Colonel Fowler. You can see the flag on there. Normally the American flag's flying on it along with the Connecticut flag, but of course since I'm here to film, it's not up there today. So although the almshouse is no longer standing, what does remain is the cemetery. Now, you'll notice a lot of these headstones are quite tiny. The grave spaces are quite narrow. Wow, great use of vocabulary, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a lot of unmarked graves for people that were unknown. Maybe these are just the ones that were known conditions to live in. It wasn't just people of poverty that were put in these places. People with, uh, let's say, mental disorders, they were also placed within these homes. People that were, that just, nobody knew how to work with them at the time, how to function and what they perceived as society. They would be put in these homes. Not a lot of food, not a lot of sleep, very grotesque living quarters. Diseases could claim you in these places. So definitely a sad end somebody ends up in an alms house like this and imagine the people that were in the alms house the day of the battle imagine what they must have been going through and speaking of sad end you'll probably notice there are flags there are veterans buried within the cemetery although it looks like the grave markers actually sadly broken off this was the grave of a veteran from the American Civil War Barlow comes up here and he, he realizes what's happening pretty quickly. Yeah, he, th I do believe that he had good intentions. I can understand wanting to move up here because of higher ground, but he was not expecting an attack from the north. And by moving himself up to the knoll, as I said earlier, he had kind of, ex uh, he had caused gaps with the rest of the 11th Corps. He's coming up, trying to rally. As he turns around to the, his back's now facing the Confederates, he'll take a bullet to his spine it'll bore into his abdomen he's gonna fall from his horse uh, several soldiers orderlies aides whatever you want to call them they're gonna help Barlow up they're gonna start walking him down toward the almshouse but the Confederates are moving too hotly on their rear Barlow uh, is gonna be hit a second time he's gonna fall to the ground and the soldiers that were helping him just decide to leave him for dead Keep in mind, his soldiers don't feel highly about him. They don't have a strong connection with a lawyer from Massachusetts and a well-to-do family with a lot of these poor, uh, uh, poor stricken uh, German soldiers. You know, they don't usually see eye to eye with each other, so they leave him for dead. Very quickly, the Confederates will overrun this position. <sighs> Look at that. Look at that sweat bee. I'm going to have to stop here soon. Sorry about that. As Barlow's later on the ground, several bullets will cut through his coat. He'll be shot in the finger. That's how intense the fighting was up here. Bullets whizzing back and forth like sweat bees. See, I tied it back in some way. Now, amongst the Confederate units that assaulted this knoll were the 38th Georgia. They were organized back in October of 1861. And when they started, they had about 1,200 men in their force. Pretty large for a regiment, especially considering it's a Confederate regiment. But 
through several battles such as Gaines Mill, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville. They were whittled down to only about 350 men here when they arrived on the fields here on July 1st, 1863. Uh, they're commanded by a Lieutenant, a Lieutenant William McLeod. Uh, now a little bit about McLeod. Uh, uh, he was pretty low liked by his soldiers, actually really well liked. Might be a reason for that. Uh, he got into a bit of controversy when he was promoted up as a major to take charge of the regiment. Uh, he was charged with allowing the soldiers to gamble freely in the encampments. And also saying some, let's say, sedacious things like, uh, you know, maybe this isn't worth fighting, maybe you should go home. He was accused of this, but he was found not guilty. Keep that in mind. Anyway, McLeod was pretty well liked. He's only 22 years old, pretty young, commanding a colonel. Uh, he's gonna come up the hills behind us, charge his men, rally them with his sword, call them forward. He'll take a bullet to the temple and be killed instantly on the field. Uh, his slave is going to bury him under a peach tree off the battlefield. And after the war is over, that slave, who is now a freed man, and the and McLeod's brother-in-law are going to come back, find his remains, and take them back for burial. With Barlow lying on the field, this is where one of the great stories of the American Civil War are going to begin. As the story is told by General John B. Gordon of the Confederate Army, Gordon is going to ride up with his brigade. He is going to oversee the, the ground that they've just captured. And he's going to find this Union general laying on the ground, clothes torn by bullets. Uh, he very quickly realizes that this is most likely going to be a mortal wound, he believes, because the guy's been in his spine, doesn't seem he's able to move. He's going to offer this Union general water from his canteen. Uh, and, other, and we'll also make arrangements to make sure letters that were on the soldier would be destroyed. Uh, letters to his wife, I guess he didn't want Gordon or anybody else reading them. Uh, that officer will go off and Gordon later learns that is a Francis Barlow divisional commander in the 11th Corps. That night on July 1st, Gordon is going to get wind that Barlow's wife is in the town of Gettysburg and makes arrangements for her to come across lines to visit her dying, uh, dying husband. Now, two, th two days later, when the Confederates are defeated here at Gettysburg, Gordon, along with the rest of the Confederates, pack up and begin evacuating, leaving Barlow and assumes to his death. Let's fast forward then to 1879 to a dinner in New York City uh, for a Democrat congressman. Gordon has been invited, key to a Democrat congressman by this point, and he is going to be introduced to a gentleman by the name of Barlow. And he asks, are you, sir, related to the Barlow that was killed at Gettysburg? And Barlow smiles and says, why, sir, actually I am that individual. Uh, Gordon claims he is ecstatic, overwhelmed, tears flowing from her eyes, I'm sure, and the two become great friends throughout the remainder of, the remainder of their lives. Makes for a poetic story of reconciliation in the American Civil War. Probably not true. At least not according to the paperwork left in the wake of the war. The earliest surviving letter Francis Barlow dictates is after his wounding on July 7th. He makes no mention of Gordon, but rather a pizzera of General Early staff. Many have accepted this to be a misspelling of Lieutenant Andrew L. Pitzer, who indeed was an aide to General Early. Further, his initial letters make no mention of his wife Arabella arriving to his side. Barlow does confirm destroying letters, however, but they were not meant for Arabella. Historians have found evidence to support that these letters were to or from high-profiled abolitionists. Barlow was seeking a chance to switch commands out of the 11th Corps to that of one of the newly formed brigades of the United States Colored Troops. Although gravely wounded on the knoll, he had the wherewithal to destroy these letters. He feared what would become of him should his letters be captured by the Confederates. Historians such as William F. Hanna began to point out the discrepancies of what happened on the knoll in Barlow's accounts. The National Park Service came to view the story as a myth, having a wayside marker on the knoll relating the story removed at the turn of the 21st century. But if Gordon's story is a complete fabrication, why did Barlow never denounce it as such? In 1893, Gordon delivered a lecture in New York City of stories from the American Civil War. It included his account of Barlow's knoll. 
The lecture was attended by over 5,000 and would have been a featured attraction in the New York area. Being a prominent resident of the Big Apple, Barlow may have attended. At the very least, he would have known of the lecture. If Gordon's account was wrong, why didn't Barlow make a statement? One other wrench into this tale is that there are two accounts from the battle describing Arabella Barlow passing between the lines. One from 11th Corps Commander General Howard and another from a young resident named Daniel Skelly. Both claim to see Ab Arabella passing between the lines on different days. It appears Arabella did not locate her husband until July 4th at the earliest. Her search would have been difficult as Barlow was carried to a multitude of field hospitals over the course of the Free Day battle. If you would like to delve into every detail about the Gordon Barlow story, I recommend checking out Scott Hartwink's multi-part series on the Gettysburg National Military Park's blog, From the Fields of Gettysburg. I used it for sources to do my research upon and is a fair handling of the incident. I'll provide a link in the description below. I'll finish up with my own guess based upon the information I've received. I believe Barlow was found by Pitzer and carried from the field sometime after Gordon's brigade had captured the knoll. Pitzer, or perhaps another aide, informed Gordon in passing of the severity of the fight by mentioning the presumed mortal wounding of a high-ranking Union general. Barlow's wife was in town as early as the night of July 1st, searching for her husband, but I do not believe Barlow and Gordon met properly on the fields of Gettysburg. At some point in his later years, perhaps at that dinner in the 1870s, Gordon connected the dots This was the same Barlow wounded at Gettysburg. Gordon could have researched and figured out that Barlow and himself had faced off on three of the bloodiest battlefields of the war in three consecutive years, with both receiving wounds that were deemed mortal but made full recoveries. The coincidences set the crux for a very good story of reconciliation, something Barlow and other veterans were seeking in their twilight years. But I'm by no means an expert. I, nor any one of us today, were on that knoll that bloody July afternoon. If it's all made up by Gordon for street cred, at the very least it gives many a reason to explore a part of the Gettysburg battlefield that does not get the recognition it deserves.